Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching this Monday night in-depth ag forecast here on March 20th, 2023, brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions. We're going to start tonight with a question I got uh, twice over the last week, and it's from growers that are in the Midwestern part of the United States. So I'm going to kind of focus on there uh, to start uh, tonight's video. What you've been looking at here is a sea surface temperature anomaly map back on December the 15th. And at that point, we were still very much in a La Nina dominated pattern. Now, what has happened since then, of course, is that this has changed dramatically. The very strong trade winds are now gone. We've now seen westerly wind bursts in this area. Warmer water has returned. We're well above average over here near South America and almost too average here in the central equatorial Pacific. The only signal hanging on is really this negative PDO signal. That is the colder water that's up against the west coast of North America with the warmer water between um, Alaska and Hawaii. And that's a signal we need to be watching evolve over the next 90 days because and this is the idea, if it continues to look like this and it's July and August, this is just a dry signal for the midsection of the country. But we will watch for this to moderate quite a bit. And remember, as we've been talking about, this tends to compete with what's going on on the equatorial Pacific. Now, just to be very clear, all of these factors are... Um, are symptomatic of what the atmosphere is up to. And what we need to pay attention to is how it is gaining momentum or losing momentum, where that momentum shift is happening and what it means overall to the flow of the atmosphere. Because the loss of this La Nina and the potential, you know, very quick transition, watch this, going toward El Nino conditions by maybe as soon as summer. Watch how quickly that evolves in this area. That's going to be maybe our most important um, forecasting metric going forward. I think all the models are too aggressive on it, but even if they're, let's say they're halfway toward the right speed at which this evolves, this is still a very quick transition away from inso neutral into La Nina conditions. So this is the question. If you go back and look all the way back to when we have the most reliable data, so from 1950 to present, and you look at all of the big uh, El Nino events versus the La Nina events, and specifically the years that transition from La Nina to El Nino, have there been years, and I was asked this by a, a two growers that form, uh, farm corn, excuse me, they asked, are there any El Nino years when we had a developing El Nino that we were off trend nationally? So what I did was I went quickly to the USDA NAS data set, pulled up national corn yield, made a quick spreadsheet of it, detrended it. By the way, if we continue this trend line, we're at about 180 when you detrend from 1970 to present. If you detrend from uh, 2000 to present, the next year's average yield should be about 181, a little bit, a little bit over that. But here we go. Uh, I plucked off those years that were El Nino building years, like the one that we're anticipating. And this is what you've got. Of the 17 times that that happened since 1970, um, I only found one, two, three that were below trend. That would be 1977, that would be 1997, and 2002. And remember, 2002 was incredibly hot. But all the rest of them were either on trend or above trend. So we would say 14 and 17 times that this has happened since 1970 we tended to be above trend on national cordial numbers. Now, this does not mean there's not local drought development. This doesn't mean that everybody has just plenty of rain. But what it typically means is there's a momentum increase in the jet stream that tends to provide more systems that roll through the United States, and it tends to prevent big anti-cyclones, big ridges from forming in the midsection of the United States. And, and here's kind of the evidence of that. Uh, I'm going to show you a couple of maps. This is May to September. We're just going to look over a long time period here. And this particular map first shows us the correlation with uh, of what's called a multivariate inso index. So this is against precipitation. So these colors would mean wetter and these would mean drier. And what we notice here is that just purely using El Nino, which it's March, this is about the only thing I can show you out this far, um, we do just see, you know, better, better precip for a lot of the United States. And even we can make an argument that the drier signal that you see over here on the East Coast, that relies on getting the Bermuda high to get really close to the East Coast. So that's got to happen as well. There's several things that have to go on to make this occur. And then on the temperature side of that, let's flip this over to the temperature correlation with the multivariate inso index. And this is what we end up getting. So if there is going to be a, I think, a heat issue, and it's and we're leaving this all up to El Nino, it's going to be in the western United States. But it's not there right now. It's very cold in the west, which means we're going to be looking for that May to September time frame to see heat build here if 
El Nino is the most dominant teleconnection going forward. So I hope that answers that question as to some of the reasons why, you know, you're hearing that this might be a year that's on trend for yield for corn and beans in the midsection of the country uh, and whatnot. But let's let's keep thinking about this, though. We still have to get over what we're currently dealing with, which over the last seven days has been very cold conditions across much of, of the United States and Canadian prairie. We've seen multiple shots at colder air getting let out here. In fact, we've had pretty significant frost events that have gotten all the way down to the uh, Gulf Coast and the East Coast, except for right here in South Carolina and North Carolina, where there was some cloud cover last night. We got this frost pretty far down to the south. I was looking carefully at that, and I made a map here, and I apologize. I should have refined this before I showed it to you, but I had some questions from some wheat growers here in the eastern Corn Belt about the number of hours that were spent below 29 Fahrenheit, and it was determined that given the stage of where the wheat is grown here in southern, it's almost like along I-70 and then in into uh, Kentucky. And through this area, um, anything sustained below 29 Fahrenheit could have produced some damage. And so if you look in here, I'm just going to blow this up so you can see a little bit better. You know, this pinkish color represents more than 48 hours going from the 15th of March until yesterday and of having that. Now, remember, this is below 29. That's why you don't see the coloring all the way down here. Plus, I don't include today's data. So we're just looking at the duration of this cold shot of air that came into this particular air. And I wanted to illustrate that we spent a lot of time very cold over the weekend uh, in this particular region. So just wanted to answer that question as well. Then we turn our heads to what's going on in the northern plains. Uh, so just kind of stitching this all together. Um, we've got another thing to overcome here, and that is there's a lot of water that's in the snow here in the Dakotas coming out of Montana, then into Minnesota, Wisconsin, the UP, and Michigan. Two to 10 inches of liquid. So even if this area is forecast dry going into April and May, let's just say even if it is, and then this melts, it's as though it was a wet spring because of how much moisture is in that snow. Much of this area is having one of its wettest starts to any year on record, going back to 1893. And that's not to even mention what we've been continually covering in the West. And we got another big storm system coming into the West. Parts of the Sierra Nevada have over 100 inches of liquid in them. We're at 125, 135, excuse me, percent of normal snowpack here in the um, in the upper Colorado basin. There's snow all throughout and north of the Snake River Valley into Wyoming, Montana. Even the Cascades are looking pretty good in terms of, of snowpack. So we just have an excess here, which is going to continue to cause major flooding issues into California. Now, remember, they've since opened the spillway on Lake Orville. Uh, and the reason why they're doing that is because as this all melts, like I said, there's another 100 inches of water in this. And so Lake Oroville, most of the reservoirs in California should be full. We've been covering that a lot, so I'm just going to step away from it in this particular video, but we'll come back to it throughout this week several times. Now, I also got asked today about um, what it would take to really just balloon the central United States temperatures and to melt that snow up north and to bring a rapid onset of spring, given how cold things have been as of late. So I went back and I said, all the way back to 1895, find me these warmest central United States um, Aprils. What do we need to see to get a really, really warm April? And we got them all ranked down here. And this is it. We've got, oops, let's shrink that up so you can see it. What, what needs to happen is we need troughing in Alaska. You need the gesture to come screaming through the, uh, um, you know, through the Aleutian Islands and then dive here and actually have a secondary low to the south of it off the Baja and almost kind of get pinched up into an Omega pattern centered mainly in Minnesota. And if that whole block setup gets going, there's almost one, two, three ridges, um, then we would just see major heat building into the midsection of the country in a very rapid planting. So this is the setup here, this, this, this Alaska trough. So we're going to go looking for that. Now, remember, you're going to keep your eye right here. And as I play this forward, uh, we have troughs that are coming through, but nothing sticking around. And we just keep seeing multiple troughs diving into the west and ridges building into Alaska. So the jet stream displays south. The flow continues to have high momentum in it. We don't break away from the broader troughing that's across much of North America. And that's because when you look globally at where the, the cold temperatures are, they're not in Europe. They're not in Russia. They're not in China. They've been displaced over to this side of the planet. We just keep seeing this very active pattern continuing there. So I do not see us, at least through most of April, 
building into this pattern. But if it's going to go warm and you're in the central United States, it's going to go warm. Your clue is going to be right here. Watch for deep troughing to get set up and stay there to really increase the North Pacific jet momentum to dive into the West and then block up into Omega pattern right here. That would do it. That would bring in a tremendous amount of, of spring warmth. And that would just kind of blow the doors wide open on planting in the midsection of the United States. But as we just saw, not a whole lot of indication of that coming to finish March and to start April. That's what you're looking at here. This all goes all the way through the first week of April. Uh, there's another component to this. It would really help if we could keep the MJO out here in the open Pacific Ocean. This is like phases seven and eight. But as we're going to see, the MJO designated by these colors in through here is back over. Just follow it north, uh, up down on the graph. So through the end of March and beginning of uh, of, of April, it's it's here. It's in the Indian Ocean or north of uh, um, uh, Australia, excuse me. And that is just not the right position to have a tropical telenet connection to bunch the jet stream up into a big omega pattern in the Midwest. See how that kind of works? We're kind of comparing the tropics to the extra tropics. So the MJO instead is over in phase one. It's going to try to jump out into phase two and phase three not over here where we want it. This is where we want to see it. I want it to pop back out into phase five, six, and seven. Because historically, let's just pick a phase. If it's April and we do not have an El Nino, excuse me, we do not have an El Nino or a La Nina, phase seven in April, if we just take a look at it here, yeah, see, we get a little bit of weak ridging um, that happens in the Aleutian Islands, troughing here, trough there, and then there's your ridge. That could do it. That would open it up. But we've really got to get the MJO back out into the West Pacific to see this happen. And right now it's in the Indian Ocean moving toward the West Pacific, but may not get there until we get fully into maybe halfway through the month uh, of April. Now, remember, the pattern can change in a heartbeat, right? Uh, think back to 2018. Uh, this right here, statewide average temperatures in 2018. This was one of our coldest springs in the midsection of the country in recent memory. In fact, in all of our data collecting, you know, Iowa and Wisconsin had their coldest Aprils on record. Okay, so that occurred. And then the following May, like I said, just kind of blew wide open. Uh, Illinois, I look at all these states right in through here, all had record warm Mays. And I'll never forget this because I did a calculation for the first two weeks of May in Illinois because it was dry as well. And uh, during that time period, because if you look here, we were near normal on precip for the month. Um, the state of Illinois planted its corn crop at an average pace of 400 acres a minute. So when the window opened, crop went in. Okay, so with all of that as a backdrop, we do have new data for the month of April. Okay, and the European model did not budge from where it was in the previous runs from Friday. It continues to just see... If there is warmer conditions coming through, they're transient and there's just more cooler air anchored in the west, but at times coming out of the Canadian prairie, northern plains and down here into the uh, over to the Appalachian Mountains in the eastern, co eastern side of the United States. The warmth you see over the Great Lakes, that's because it's mostly ice free. And then we do see weak ridging at times, keeping Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas a bit mild compared to normal. But they, the model didn't break at all from what it had been showing. And on the precipitation side of it, about the only changes is it backed off on the extent of this really wet weather. It's now got it more in the Mid-South, parts of the Midwest, really focused into this area. I can say that it did have, uh, it is now less dry for the Southern Plains. Maybe there's something pushing through that we're going to talk about here in a few moments. But overall, um, this is still suggesting a wet and cool May for much of this area. And then there's a lot of snowpack here that's got to melt in the north and very cold conditions still in the west, even though we're now starting to see a drier signal for the west. And this is, I mean, everybody wants this. We need to get a drier signal and eventually a warmer signal coming for the western United States. We're going to talk about that throughout this week as well. All right, just a reminder, this was NOAA's outlook for the month of April. Now, NOAA was seeing more, I think, of a progression of the MJO to get us back into something like this with the southeastern ridge. And that would make sense to pull the moisture here and track systems in this direction running up uh, into some drier weather anchored into the southwest. I think that's what they were going after with this forecast. But remember, they released this on March the 16th. So just it was, it was a little while ago. 
when we also look at what the CFS v2 is doing, can you mind just kind of squinting your eyes here? There's week one and week two. So we know this, right? Look at the colder pattern. But by week three, week four, the model no longer keeps the warmer bias it had here over the eastern side of the country. In fact, maybe a little bit of a warm up that second week of April, but they're trying to bring back in the colder conditions once again. So even the CFS v2 has backed off on giving us a hope for just a really warm April at this point. Until that changes, until maybe the MJO moves around or some blocking actually sets up in the in, in, in the jet stream, I don't know why this would fail. I think this might be what we're dealing with. I'll be looking for those signals for warmth, but I'm not finding them as of yet. Now, today I got asked a question about drought. And I was talking to a grower in Kansas, and the question was, all right, Kansas is clearly the epicenter of the deepest drought that's still in place. Now, we know there's a bunch of snow here that's going to help continue to cure this. There's a bunch of snow here that's going to erode this, but in Kansas, we've just missed out on it. In fact, you look back over the last month, and models have overpredicted rainfall in this area quite a bit. There's been a few scattered storm events, but overpredicted rainfall here. It's actually overpredicted on the Gulf Coast and East Coast as well. But you notice that all around it, there's 150 to 300 percent of normal precip here across the northern tier of the U.S. The mid south has been wet, and of course, the west, especially as of late, has been extremely wet. So we begin to ask, what does it take to get rid of this? What would have to happen in April or May to eliminate this drought quickly? And here's the answer. I just picked out Kansas, but this would apply for the surrounding states. And I said, tell me what it takes to get one of these wet Kansas, April, and May timeframes. And this is what it would take. The jet stream has got to develop a deeper trough, excuse me, there we go. A deeper trough sitting here and a deeper trough that's going to sit right over the state of Arizona. You see, if that happens, the jet stream will end up doing this. And if it makes that hard turn around a trough repeatedly in Arizona, what it ends up doing is it takes the dry land, which has been as far east as about the 98th meridian, and starts to pull it back. It starts to allow more of the moisture to get pulled into these systems that are forming farther and farther to the west. In other words, we're eliminating the extended rain shadow. So if we start to see troughing over the Aleutian Islands and troughing over Arizona, that is the best setup for Kansas to return moisture. Now, I'll tell you something. This would come via incredibly nasty, severe spring weather into that area. That's what we would get in April and May because this would open up the Gulf, transport the heat in the unstable air north, and we would light it up with severe weather. So we need to eat away at this drought in a slow mechanism, not all at once due to the risk of having a lot of severe weather should this particular pattern set up. This is a storm chaser's dream right here. And if they're happy, we're not happy here in the midsection of the country. So let's keep all of that in the back of our minds as we kind of forecast this forward, because this is what the jet stream's doing. If we just play this out here through the end of this week, getting into next week, in fact, I'm just going to park it out there at 10 days. We're just trying to look at the evolution of this. The jet's retracted. There's a split here, but then we have this subtropical branch that's running in this direction. So this is not a dry signal for the west. This is not a warm signal for the midsection of the country. Where's the big ridge? And then you look at this overall pattern and say, this is carrying quite a bit of momentum in the subtropical part of this jet. And this split is it's west of the international dateline. So we're not we're not set up with this pattern to um, give us any of the things I just told you about. I, I guess that's what I want to say. And so the end result of all of this is that we continue to see, at least for the next 10 days, wetter conditions where it's been wet. That's California, Nevada, the four corner states. We tend to see the colder air stay where it's been here, penetrating into the south. And there is a significant flood threat in this area going forward. And we still see a drier signal in the models in the plains. Now, it's not bone dry. It's just a drier signal. So that is how I'm stitching together the current pattern we're in. And now you know what I will be watching for, for there to be a break. All right. So what's going on right now? Well, today, again, we had the clear skies that got pretty far to the south with high pressure. That led to the deep frost we talked about earlier. But as we kind of just walk back on this whole day, remember, this is our equinox. So we can see the Terminator here running north-south. As we kind of just play this forward... We can see the extent of the snow across the north we've talked a lot about. We can even see today there's some more controlled burns. Can you see it just here in parts of, of uh, Arkansas? But what I'm watching is the momentum carried in these high-level winds right here. You can see them blowing around those cloud tops. 
there's actually two lows I'm watching, one coming out here and one coming out right there that's going to get out into the midsection of the country. So one will move this way. Whoa, sorry. Let's try that again. One is going to come out here. Second one's going to run farther to the north. And on Tuesday, a big low is going to come into California. So we've got winter storm watches in the mornings, flood warnings, high wind warnings. Then we see what's going on in the four corner states with high winds. We have another day of frost and freeze in the south and east, although not getting as far south as yesterday. And winter weather advisories, winter storm watch here for the uh, upper Midwest around the Red River Valley of the north. So here it is tomorrow. You can see those lows. Here's the one coming into California. Here's the one that's to the south. Here's the one that's to the north. And the one that's to the south is feeding on the flow coming around this ridge. We're concerned that as it pops out here, we could be watching out for some warm frontal storms getting into this area. But it's going to be a major swing in the temperature for these folks compared to what they've seen as of late. So let's go right on into the high res NAM to see how this all starts. We're going to start around 6 o'clock tonight. And as I play this forward, you're going to see those two lows, one and two, start to emerge. So they're spreading snow in Montana. This one leads and puts down some showers here by tomorrow morning in parts of Kansas, Oklahoma, Arkansas, Missouri. Maybe a chance for some mixed precip back here in parts of Nebraska. While all of that is coming through the midsection of the country, high pressures east and another deep low is moving into California. We've seen snow levels of about 6,000 feet, maybe one to two feet of snow, heavier rains in the interior, and very heavy rains into Southern California. So moving through the day on Tuesday, you see the first wave moving through Missouri into Illinois and into Indiana. And while that's going on, the wave to the north is delivering snow to parts of the Dakotas over the Red River Valley into northern Minnesota, Wisconsin, and the UP of Michigan. So that's this next low that's prompted the winter storm watch into this area. But as the storm system cuts through California, it's eventually going to start to get through the Four Corner states, adding more snow to the upper Colorado Basin. And there's actually going to be an elongated warm front sitting right in this area that throughout the day on Wednesday, we're going to keep an eye on for the potential for some stronger storms. This is a tough one for me to forecast where these storms could possibly be. The Storm Prediction Center has them here on Wednesday in parts of Iowa, Missouri, Kansas, but that's still just a marginal risk. What we're going to watch is as that low emerges, on um, day four, which would be Thursday, possibly in central Texas to the Red River Valley of the south, and day five over the lower Mississippi River Valley. So that's a day four and day five outlook. That's the end of this week, uh, Thursday and Friday. So we're going to go to our multi-model analysis to see those. 12Z GFS on the left, 12Z European on the right. So let's play where we've already seen through. So we've already got up to about this point. Now on th uh, Thursday morning, right here, Take note of where the GFS is putting down snow versus the European. European is here. GFS is a bit farther to the north. There's going to be some scattered storms and rain into this area coming out of northern Missouri, southern Iowa, into northern Illinois, and then into the eastern Great Lakes. So this is now Thursday morning, Thursday afternoon, and evening. Already the models are having a difficult time understanding where the stalled out frontal boundary is because the European brings a high in here while leaving the broader high there. The GFS has a similar position on this high, but a much broader high to the north. And that's just changing the position of this front. And why that's important is it's going to tell us how much rain is going to fall in this area. Because as we go forward from Thursday into Friday morning, this is where we're going to be watching the risk of the strongest of your storms. Remember Thursday night, right in through this area. And then we're going to see on the back side of this maybe some more snow cutting through this area. Notice what the European is doing. Now remember, on Friday night, I'm going to keep an eye on the lower Mississippi River Valley. It is in both models here. And also, this is just a nonstop pattern. We've got another system coming into the northwest. So this is Friday night, getting into Saturday morning, Saturday afternoon, and evening. And then that low curls through New England. Now the models are attempting to give enough cold air into the interior of New England to add more snow to this area. And it's actually in both models here, but from southern Ontario to southern Quebec and then possibly interior portions of New England, we're looking at a pretty sizable system coming through. Now that's just through Sunday. We then see that early next week, both models are attempting to take that system that came down through the Pacific Northwest and eject it in here. So that's another time period on probably Sunday night, Monday, of severe weather in the south, maybe another round of snow cutting through this area, and more rain for the eastern Corn Belt. And don't forget, there's another system that follows it. 
So this is next Monday into Tuesday. You can see as that one tries to exit east, there's, I don't know, is this the fourth or fifth system coming down here into the, uh, into the west. So I want to compare models. GFS, if it's wetter, you get these colors. If the European is wetter, you get those. So notice where the GFS is wetter. It's wetter in this area. And that was the difference in the position of the front. So the European's wetter on all sides of it. But the GFS is wettest right in through this corridor when you compare the next uh, uh, seven days. If we just get a broader view of this, this is the probability of getting at least an inch of liquid out of the next 10 days. And that's where our wettest conditions are going to be east of the Rocky Mountains. In the west, we can start stepping this up. This is the probability of two inches of liquid equivalent. So the, still the west has got a lot of wet weather coming in. And again, we're going to watch Missouri, southern Illinois, Indiana for the wettest conditions. On the snow side of it, I'm going to show you the, the European model. So here's the snow from system number one coming through. Uh, this is where the winter storm advisories, uh, weather, uh, winter storm watches are out today for tomorrow. And then we're going to see the next system coming through, possibly bringing in snow from Kansas to Iowa to northern Illinois and Wisconsin. That's the one that's this Friday into Saturday. That's the one that possibly brings in the snow into the interior of New England. And then remember, there's another system that follows it next Monday, Tuesday. And you see where it's adding the snow. So we're trying to identify those snowy corridors. Now notice I only talked about what was happening east of the Rockies. We have a lot of snow in the upper Colorado Basin, maybe another one to two feet coming into the Sierra Nevada and six to 24 inches coming into the Cascades and even decent snows in the northern Rockies. So let's look at it now in terms of the probability of getting certain snow amounts. This is the chance of getting at least three inches over the next 10 days. Here's the chance of six. Here's the chance of 12. Now we're starting to just identify the big mountains in the interior of New England. Let's keep going. There's the chance of 18 and two feet. Now you can see where we're identifying those heaviest snow areas. So that kind of distills down what this pattern's up to right now. It's a whole lot of this, okay, with following waves of colder air that come in behind it. Now, by day 10, the end of March, we still haven't gotten what we wanted, which is deep troughs here. Because if a deep trough came in there, oh, this all blows up into a ridge. Nope, we continue to keep this, which is why the week two pattern still looks wetter in this area, even wetter in parts of California. And there's agreement with the GFS as well. In fact, the GFS has got a broader area of wet conditions and even wetter in the West compared to the European model. It's much more aggressive with this pattern. All right, from here, let's finally talk temperatures. Now this includes this morning, because I only make this map once a day, I should change the frequency of that. But this is where we're looking at a frost over the next seven days. Let's examine those low temperatures real quick. So this was Monday morning's lows. Here's Tuesday. So again, watching this white line, the zero degree isotherm for where there could be another frost. Then we get into Wednesday, the warm sector opens up and it really sends warm air pretty far to the north. There's Thursday. Now these are overnight low temperatures, very mild in this area. We're actually gonna open this up to 60s and 70s in this area for highs on Thursday. But that's why we got the severe weather risk down here. The front tries to clear through on Friday into Saturday, bringing in the colder air. And then we get out here uh, to uh, Sunday. And again, we're just kind of seeing the pattern favor something like this in terms of the jet stream behavior. Longer term, we come back to one of the things we started with. When does the colder air finally displace? Because really, from the 22nd through the 27th, okay, there's a rebound in temperatures here, but we stay anchored in the cold. The model's been very consistent with this in the northern plains, upper Midwest, and also here in the western United States. And as I just play this forward, we see that through the end of March and the beginning of April, like we talked about at the beginning of this report, we just keep seeing the models want to push more cooler air all the way across the United States. And that's why we think that if there's going to be a pattern change, it's going to have to be maybe 20 plus days away from now that starts to really shift this around. Okay, so that's my, that's my narrative for North America. In South America, we know that for the last several months, but especially the last three, along the Paraná River Basin, we've not only been dry, but exceptionally dry, uh, very, very dry. Remember, we had the frost event that got in here around February 18th, which was kind of bookended by weeks where the temperatures were up in the hundreds. So the, the, the amount of variability in the weather pattern in Argentina has just been tremendous. And look what it's doing now. 
over the next 10 days, we are expecting in that same basin that's in drought, possibly an extra four inches of rainfall compared to average. So it's like getting a very wet go of it in the Midwest, uh, United States in September. Heavy, heavy rains coming too late. This is very important. This dry signal in through here, this is an area that's very late in harvesting soybeans. We had a lot of flooding in this area uh, in February and early March. So to see a drier signal means they're gonna rapidly finish harvesting soybeans and get a safrina crop in. And then here into uh, Mato Grosso, near normal precipitation on the safrina crop. It had been wetter, but we do see near normal precip. Now we ask, is there anything that's gonna stop this monsoon and, and hurt this late planted safrina crop? Well, if we just look out there all the way through the month of April, I don't see it. There's no indications right now that this monsoon is just going to shut off all of a sudden and cause major problems. Now, if that changes, I will be sure to let you know, but I'm not seeing it at this point. Okay, I'm going to stop there. Have a good rest of your night, and I'll talk to you again very soon. Thanks.